Hello and welcome to the Man Enough Podcast. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And today we have a different type of episode here. It's just us. Today no, we're notes. Gonna, no notes. No notes. <laughs> today we're going to get to know the one and only mm. Jamie Heath. Why am I here? Why am I on this podcast? We're going to pull uh, the chair of the therapist chair. We're your therapists. We're here to walk right? you through your journey. <laughs> this All right, is, I love it. I this love is therapy. a safe space. But, I love it. But, but it's been really sweet to see the response because so many people I know have messaged you mm. and our account um, and just said how grateful they have been for your voice and your perspective mm. and your vulnerability and your willingness to share. And uh, I thought it'd be nice to get to know you and mm. tell your story because we get bits and pieces of we it. We do. Here and there. Very good bits and, and pieces. We, we want more. 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 So... Uh, Please don't go anywhere. We will be right back. This is the Man Enough Podcast. Are you somebody who suffers from sleeplessness, anxiety, and pain? <laughs> I'm raising both <laughs> my hands and my legs all up in the air. Have you ever seen those uh, those commercials, those advertisements mm -hmm. where it's like the person like can't open the, yes. the cup, like, oh, and yes. then it spills all over them? That's what anxiety feels like. <laughs> well, we have a solution for you. Mm. CBD. D. Mm. Specifically, Feels, which is a product that I've been using. Feels is a premium CBD that it'll just help you keep your head clear and feel your best. And CBD isn't about what you feel. It's more about what you don't feel. Stress, mm. anxiety, sleeplessness. People like you and I, I think, Liz, mm -hmm. our brains are going a crazy at fast. night. Yeah. And um, I've been taking CBD at night to help me have deeper sleep, actually. Mm. And I'm somebody who I've never put a drug in my body. That's true. Um, never been high. Don't yeah. do anything like that. Never been drunk. And that's why I actually like CBD. Because for me, specifically, there's none of those symptoms. Mm. And it relaxes your body so that your mind can also relax, right? It goes exactly. both ways. Exactly. Kind of kicks in your parasympathetic nervous system. I and, love it. Uh, and I've noticed deeper sleep even on my Oura Ring um, from using it. So if you are interested, they have monthly subscriptions. They do. And you can go to feels.com slash man enough mm -hmm. for 50% off your first order. That's a lot. That's actually, that's actually a lot. Mm -hmm. That's F-E-A-L-S. I spelled it right. Dot com <laughs> slash man enough. And I hope you sleep well tonight, Liz Plank. Thank you. I will. I packed all my feels. And you're in your and, feels. And they're in my feels. Yeah. <laughs> and we're in your feels. This is man enough. So how do you feel? I, well, you know, about 30 minutes ago, you scared the hell out of me out there and the physically yeah like i actually actually yeah you actually him. physically startled and so you're coming down you came up so my whole body is still <laughs> shook <laughs> just for an, i re, you know look i think sometimes you gotta you gotta uh, bring in some joy that's mm -hmm. right to the, yeah. to the shock office. therapy jamie was, it was indeed shock therapy liz jamie was uh, working jamie was working he was on his computer and for those of you who don't know jamie and i also work together jamie pretty much runs wayfair studios now mm -hmm. one of your people and he uh he was working and he was so focused on his task. And I just thought it was a perfect idea to run up behind him and scare the shit out of him. And it worked. <laughs> you you uh, watch that. But you didn't you didn't really move. Your eyes just got really big, yeah. your pupils dilated. See, every time I go to a restaurant anywhere, I always sit with where I can see the front entrance, right? <laughs> and everything is going on. I don't like things behind me because I'm super aware looking over my shoulder. So when things like that happen, um, it it gets me because I'm always <laughs> conscious. Um, That's true. And your office is you have a big glass mm -hmm. window, right? So you can see everything, right? Yeah. You know. But so sorry, what would I happen you. if you sat with your back to the door and that you let someone else be on the lookout? Um, yeah, that doesn't happen. I I don't know what would happen because uh, mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't ever happen. He definitely wouldn't let me be on the lookout. No, I <laughs> no. It's it's um, you know there is history to this. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it happens with a lot of men, yeah. but certainly it happens with black men um, mm -hmm. where there's this sense of always needing to look over your shoulder and make yeah. sure that you're safe, that you know always what's going on. Right. Um, and I don't want to belittle everyone else's experience. Of course, people have that. But um, historically for black men, you, you will find that a lot. And, um, you know, so. Well, now I, I, now I mm -hmm. just feel really shitty. Oh, no, no. Come on, man. <laughs> You didn't do it with that. I'm just saying no. that's why right. it's in. It's still there. Well, look, let's let's yeah. use let's use that to transition mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the real stuff. All right. Uh, you ready? Let's do it. So Jamie has been, I'd say, one of my best friends for the last decade mm -hmm. or so. Um, and I write about you a lot in Man Enough mm -hmm. in the book. Because you've had to take a 
role in my life. You've assumed a role in my life that you shouldn't have had to have assumed because of my own naivete and a lack of recognizing my privilege and my own racism. You've really had to step in far too many times and let me know how problematic some of the things that I have said or done are, or just how, how I have missed things mm. that really hurt you and injured you. And all right. I kind of uh, read about bee stings. And anyways, all that to say, you've been instrumental in my journey. I wish you wouldn't have had to be, but you've also been instrumental in the journey of a few of our other friends, Andy, mm. Rain, mm. Travis. And mm. you've said things to me that have really, it just kind of felt like, um, you've slapped me in the face with your truth. And I just kind of would love to have you walk through some of your story okay. if you're open to it. Uh, so when you asked me to be a part of Man Enough, you kind of threw me into it. I had to think about what I could offer here. So here's my thought. I'll just try to just give you an outline of who I am. Um, I was raised by a black man and a white woman. Um, my white <clears throat> mother has four sisters. They all have husbands and a lot of cousins who are all white. Me and my sister were the only black family besides my father. Um, so I had to learn at a really young age how to uh, navigate the world, um, finding the acceptance of white people while also maintaining who I am, seeing that they loved me yet also carried baggage. And as I got older, I was able to see it more and more. So I learned to have compassion for their journey while also wanting to um, help open their eyes. Um, so that's afforded me an opportunity to have friends like you, other people who um, don't have my experience and have compassion for your journey while also standing very strong in mine. Yeah. And um, so <clears throat> that's helped me. But you know, here's the truth, Jay. I've screwed up a whole bunch in my life. Um, this is why I think maybe I can contribute something to our discussion. When I was um, around seven, I was molested. Um, okay, they are then, the uh, people that lived with us were removed. Um, then it happened again when I was, um, my, heart my heart's beating because I'm trying to decide how, how deep I wanna go. When I was um, around 10 and that lasted for four years or so. Um, and it was someone that I looked up to and loved and, it, and, and, and cherished. Um, only at that time, because I cherished this person who was quite older than I was, um, I, uh, it wasn't like someone's holding me down. It wasn't like being raped, nothing like that. It was, um, as if I was a participant. Mm. Um, so I never really dealt with that. I never thought I was molested. I just thought, um, I was engaged in activity with another man because that's what you do. Um, then, <clears throat> then I got around 15 years old and then I started uh, um, spending time with a woman that was uh, 30 years old at 15, 16 years old and being engaged in sexual activity. And I thought it was cool. Mm. Um, after about two years that lasted. Then I started having relationships and I was never faithful to anybody, to any woman. And yet I was raised by women and I love women. To me, you know, Liz and I, we have this thing going back and forth where my <laughs> perspective and opinion is that women are better um, for one reason or another. Um, because in my experience, women have always just been in, in it and showed me uh, how uh, magnificent they are. Um, um, and yet I was not faithful to them. Uh, my heart's still shaking. So I get married at 18, have a daughter at 20. I was not unfaithful in that marriage, but we ended up um, breaking up when I was around 21. Uh, had girlfriends, was not faithful. And I got married again when I was 30, 31. Had my son, and about uh, three years into it, I blew my marriage up um, by um, being unfaithful to my marriage multiple times multiple people, infiltrated a friend's marriage. Mm. Um, lost everything. First of all, I'm not trying to give you a sad story. I'm just trying to give you perspective. Mm. Um, I've had a wonderful life in a lot of ways too. So uh, this is not like poor me. 
Um, but my wonderful life, I also peed all over it. Mm. Um, and this woman who I adore, still adore to this day, because she um, remained such a close friend, um, my wife at the time, um, I just destroyed all of that and other people set fire to other houses. And when you set fire to homes, it's not just that home that you hurt, you hurt the houses next door who breathe in the smoke mm. of your actions and then their children and then more and more. So before you know it, a whole neighborhood is affected by that one house that you burn down. And then you see those people throughout your life and you see the scars on them and you remember that you did that to them, even though they're now walking again. Um, and I lost everything, man. I lost my business. <laughs> I lost my wife and my family. Um, I lost my place and my stature in the world amongst friends. Um, in my own faith, the Baha'i faith, um, you know, people knew who I was and um, I kind of had to take a step back because I had to uh, figure out what the hell I was doing. A year went by and I had um, started doing some soul searching. And then I flew to, um, a place where my family is and someone who's like my brother who I was raised with someone who is my uh, who when I was at my lowest was helping me financially um, and was um, someone who believed in me I infiltrated his marriage And, I blew, and at that point, blew up everything. Hurt everybody. Like, you know, all of my family. Um, who then cut me out. And all of my family who were my best friends, everyone cut me out because the fire and my poison had infiltrated, like, close to home. Um, so I slept under my bed for a year, basically. Literally under my bed. <laughs> because I couldn't find the lowest uh, place to be. And I, that seemed to be the darkest and lowliest place I could be. Um, okay, so <clears throat> so what do you do? Um, you, either I'm evil or I'm broken. And I couldn't accept that I was evil, you know? So maybe I'm broken. What the hell's wrong? How can I <clears throat> destroy and um, hurt the very people that I love so much mm -hmm. and yet also betray them. How is that possible? I, I loved my wife and yet I was able to betray her. I loved my family and could betray them. I love God and I was able to betray my commitment and relationship with God. And I have children and so I had a lot of soul searching and, um, and thank God um, I had some people, a few people that stayed with me help pulled me out. Um, I had a mother and father who uh, loved me and um, gave me permission to um, stand up again. They held me accountable. They didn't just coddle me through it, but um, so I started doing some work and uh, this is what I learned during this work. First of all, I'm accountable. What I did was my choices. Um, no one made me do this. This was my shit. Um, but I had to figure out if I was indeed as I said, evil or broken. So I started going to therapy for the first time. Cause before that, I'm just like a, you know, I'm always happy and things are good and clearly destroying things at the same time. Um, started going to therapy um, and really going deep, went on some retreats. And for the first time I started dealing with, um, and I'm careful to say this cause I don't want to conflate my choices with abuse and my childhood trauma because that is abuse when you when you hurt someone like that but this um, therapist said to me once so Damien let's go through your life so you mean to tell me when you were seven and eight people that loved you and cared for you and fed you and took you know showed you love also betrayed you then you had someone that you looked up to an older person um, family friend that was who loved you and championed you and you were really close to um, and, and I'm sure loved you very much and also took advantage and betrayed you. And then you get to be about 16 years old and then an older woman who your family has known for a long time, I'm sure loved you and yet betrayed you. Mm. 
um, is it any wonder that you now can love and betray? That this is how you've been wired. Like for some reason for you, it's okay to love and betray at the same time. Well, that, that blew me away. Um, cause I'd never put these pieces together. Um, and then I started dealing with my trauma and revisiting it so I could let it go and started having conversations with the people that hurt me. Um, some of them who I was still in contact with that I just never um, acknowledged or admitted that I was hurt by them, but I was able to have conversations with them. Um, and one in particular, um, and the most important one, um, you know, got on their knees and, um, and begged for my forgiveness. Mm. Um, it's a long, that's a whole deep story, but. Um, what did that um, feel like? Um, I believe everyone that hurts people are, are not evil people. Um, you know, there are some people that are molesting little children and they're older people and they know right from wrong. This person, um, um, I believed in my heart, um, was conflicted in their own way at that time and was still young enough to not really understand the impact of what they were doing. Um, so I was able to forgive that and move through that and, um, have a relationship today with, but so what, why do I share all this? So I had to go deep into who I was, try to be accountable, try to fix myself at the same time, start learning that I have a higher nature and a lower nature. And my higher nature is beautiful and wonderful and championed by God. And my lower nature, of course, um, we're all built with this lower nature. We all have tendencies to do, you know, mm -hmm. um, we all have a Darth Vader and a Luke Skywalker in us. <laughs> um, but, if you are not um, building up your muscles and, and practicing uh, uh, like Luke Skywalker does, Darth Vader is just right there around the corner doing push-ups, just waiting for you. Um, so I had forgot about Luke Skywalker. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't want to be that guy because people like me, you know, and I like people and I build relationships and I didn't want to burn nothing down anymore. Um, so I did a lot of deep work with that. And, um, went to everyone that I had hurt. Um, I started being involved in 12 step programs, which became my life. Um, I didn't want to do that before because I'm not broken. See, uh, before this, I thought that's for broken people, mm. which is weird because my mom also who's bipolar has been in 12 step programs and it's helped save her life. But that's possibly all also why I didn't want anything to do with 12 step programs because again, that was for broken people. Mm. But, it changed, it started changing my life. And a friend of ours, Rain Wilson, is one of the first people that um, called me out on my shit and said, when you are ready to face your shit for real, um, I'm here for you. Mm. And if you want somebody to accompany you somewhere, whatever it is, wherever, I'll be there. Mm. And he was the first to like really listen to it all. So I then had to realize and admit to myself that um, I had a lot of repair to do, that I had been abusing people um, and the people that were hurt the most were women. The very people that I said that I champion, believe in. Um, so I had to admit that I uh, had changed, needed to make changes and restructure my thinking and how I stand for women, how I stand for equality. Um, it certainly wasn't the way I was before. Golly, man. This is why even like just therapy is good it doesn't matter if it's for a podcast. When you just talk about stuff, yeah, mm -hmm. it just it just set it free. Yeah, you know, it's living otherwise it's like under the dirt, and you start so you step on it and you pack it and pack it, and then it's deeper and deeper in there. Yeah, but if you actually just you know what's the word till the soil, you know, then it, it has an opportunity to like be released. Mm -hmm. Whew. Uh, we're gonna just take a, a quick break, and uh, please please don't go anywhere. We will be right back. This is the Man Enough Podcast. Hey there, Justin here. I just want to jump in real quick and talk to you about therapy. I believe that there's nothing more important that we can do on an individual level for the health and safety of our relationships and friendships than work on ourselves and go to therapy. Therapy is like stretching in the gym. And that's why I want to talk to you about BetterHelp. BetterHelp is one of our sponsors. If you haven't been to therapy yet or experience the freeing feeling of what it's like to talk to somebody who is objective, who will not take sides, and who is licensed and trained in this area, 
please, please, please consider trying therapy via BetterHelp. That's betterhelp.com slash man enough. You get 10% off if you're a man enough listener. And whether you are struggling with depression, if you have some extra stress at work, if you have anxiety and you don't even know what to do with it, if you are having a hard time getting out of a relationship or you're having trouble in your relationship, maybe you're having trouble sleeping or you have anger issues, whatever it is that's going on, you can talk to somebody about it and they will listen. And one of the barriers to entry to therapy has always been money. A lot of people don't have insurance and therapy is expensive, but BetterHelp is making therapy much more affordable and accessible, and they even have financial aid available. So please check out BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash man enough. You get 10% off for your first month, and you can join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Going to therapy doesn't mean you're broken. It means you're human. So here I am now, um, this is now 13 years later, I'm remarried to a woman who I came with my truth and told her of my past and what I had done. Um, and somehow she was able to see that I still had, <laughs> that I still was good, that I still had potential. Mm. And I also say that my ex-wife, God bless her, she um, still checks on me all the time and loves me and sees my worth and loves my wife. They have such a great relationship. If you ever go to soulpancake.com, watch this video called The Blend and you will see my ex-wife and my wife um, and her husband and me and our relationship. Um, so what I like to do is have conversations with men about, um, the way that we just casually see women and how does it contribute to our relationship with masculinity? Um, what is that? Um, does that make me feel more manly? Does it make me feel like, why? what is all that about? Sure, I have trauma. Everyone doesn't have that same trauma, but we all have something that contributes to who we are and how we treat people. And, um, and I don't know that, uh, Men who are um, raised from the time they're babies, even if they're raised with wonderful women like I was and ideals, we are constantly told other things. Mm. And unless we are having conversations about it, you're like left to your own young resources, which is your mind and your mind's not fully developed to put all that together at 10, 11, 12, 13. So you make up, you fill in the gaps yourself and, um, you end up where maybe you don't want to be. Mm. Um, so that's a bit of my story, what you got. <laughs> it's probably, so, there's probably some things you got. Thank you for, for sharing all of that. Yeah. That, that was um, really, really beautiful. And I feel really grateful that I got to, that, that you trust us enough to share your story and, and that you trust all of our listeners too, to really share your whole self. Mm. What, was your definition of being a man before recovery versus now? How has it changed? I'm curious. You know what? <clears throat> I don't know if my definition of being a man was that much different. Mm. It was application. Um, I have a father who is, um, I think, one of the greatest mm. men to walk. He's incredible. And he showed me what it is to be a man. Mm. He's gentle. He's strong, he's compassionate, he's kind, he's loving, he's forgiving. I've never heard, honest to God, I've never heard my father say a bad thing about anybody in my entire life. Not any, not a thing, it's just not allowed. His father's also uh, a caretaker for Jamie's brother who has Down syndrome. Yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, my father full time, I mean, my, my father and my stepmother both. 40 years, uh, right? Um, you know, do loving things for my, for my brother, but my father is the home stare. Wow. So I also saw a man who was mm -hmm. man enough to be home and not think that was for women or something and have some ego about that. So I, I was shown um, how to be how to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, believing something um, and having ideals is not the same thing as application. Right? Mm -hmm. And when you have other things being thrown at you and carving your own path. Yeah. So um, my definition uh, hasn't changed much, but I believe that Always being a man is standing up for what's right. Um, I don't think it's that much different than what it is to be a woman standing up for humanity. 
Um, being humble, mm -hmm. bringing yourself to account each day, trying to be better tomorrow than you are today, every single day, mm -hmm. and looking yourself in the mirror and being honest with yourself. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's much deeper than that, <laughs> but we've got everything else telling us it's about money, it's about this, it's about that, it's about this stuff and whatever and success and those things. But I know very few people that have died that are old people that recount all those things. What they recount is how they treat people, what they did for humanity. Yeah. Um, so, you know. I'm so grateful you shared all that, man. I appreciate it, but I wanna be clear, uh, guys, that when I say it, um, I don't share it like, oh, this is my story, so have compassion for me, because I appreciate, like you you um, said, when I shared it, it's beautiful and, and uh, to hear. But, um, you can still throw darts at me. I'm willing for people in the world to throw darts. I deserve darts till the day I die. I'm good with that. That doesn't mean I still don't deserve compassion. That doesn't, that's okay. There's gonna be, there are people that are hurt, that I've hurt. And when you hurt people, you know, you, you just gotta be accountable and mm -hmm. be willing to accept mm -hmm. that. And, and if I've hurt one woman, I've hurt 10 women. Mm -hmm. Their sister and their mother and grandmother and children and so on. And if you, um, so the impact and the ripple effect is great. So I'm, I say these things so that hopefully another man that has some experience in my life with this, this walk of life can feel um, safe to acknowledge it in themselves and that they are not evil, that there are some things that are broken, but those broken things can be corrected, mm -hmm. can be fixed. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Whew. I hate to have to do this, but we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. This is the Man Enough podcast. So today's show is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the most comprehensive daily nutritional beverage that I have ever tried. And look, I am a vitamin addict. I love taking my daily vitamins and Athletic Greens is the best part of my morning because it forces me to drink eight ounces of water. Yes. So you mix it in water. It tastes delicious. And so now I look forward to drinking my eight ounce uh, glass of water every morning. So with many stressors in our life, it's really hard to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients that they need to thrive. This is where Athletic Greens can help. Their daily all-in-one superfood powder is by far the easiest and most delicious nutritional habit that you can add to your health routine and empower you to take ownership over your health. One tasty scoop contains 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multi-mineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more. And those all work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. They increase your energy, they increase your focus, aid with digestion, and support your immune system. It's all in one. I can't recommend Athletic Greens enough. I actually was in a relationship with someone who had a lot of Athletic Greens at their house, and I think I stayed in that relationship longer because of the Athletic Greens. And now I have my own, which is really exciting. It's lifestyle friendly. If you're paleo, if you're vegan, if you're dairy free, if you're gluten free, it contains less than one gram of sugar without compromising on taste. And right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during the winter months. Winter? Oh my God. Let me get through the fall first. Uh, they are offering our audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. We're traveling again. We're going. You'll get it with your first purchase if you visit athleticgreens.com slash man enough and join health experts, athletes, and go-getters around the world who make a daily commitment to their health every day. Again, athleticgreens.com slash man enough and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. You know, it's, um, we interviewed Jason Wilson the other day mm -hmm. and, um, I know I had a pretty visceral reaction right off the bat. I had this with his first question and I started crying. And I mentioned it, that I felt it was because I felt safe with him. Um, and there's not a lot of, I, I want to be careful saying this because there's far fewer safe places for women, but there's not a lot of safe places for men to be this vulnerable and that exist in the world. There's just not. Um, because men, we, first of all, we're not taught this, mm. but also oftentimes it's used, other uh, other men can use this mm -hmm. against us. Um, and what I hope this podcast is for our listeners and what I love about being one of the three of us here is that it 
it's a safe place mm -hmm. um, because that's also what recovery is. You know, what, what you going into a place like that and being able to be broken is the very thing that allows you to heal. Mm -hmm. It is. And I have to believe that because there are so few safe places for us men to be broken, we're not healing. And um, so for anybody who's listening, and Jamie, this is my question for you. If, if there's, they don't have to have maybe blown up their marriages or lives. Sure. Um, but there are many ways in which we men hurt people. And we don't often look at the fact that we're hurting. So what do you say to the men out there who are listening? who are maybe acting in ways that they don't want to act because they're good people. How, what, what's the step? What's the first step so they don't have to go and blow up their lives? What, well, what, what, I'll what, say this. Part of why I never admitted I was broken before is because I wanted the approval of, of other men and didn't want to like show my vulnerability that I was broken. Here's what's interesting. This is like one of the um, silver linings that happens. When you do say it, um, so many of the people that I was afraid that would judge me, then behind closed doors are like, oh man, can I talk to you? Mm -hmm. They come out of the woodwork. They come out, man. Yeah. All of a sudden it was like the very people that I was trying to posture in front of were the ones now texting me and calling and said, hey, do you mind if we get together? I got something I want to talk to you about. All of a sudden to them, to some of these ones, I was more manly because I was admitting that I was broken and that I had weakness and all of and this stuff. And you became a safe place for them. So I have, if there's one thing that's come from this, and, and, and I wish I didn't have to go through what I've gone through in order to get here, but when you do do some stuff, how then do I use it to, um, so that it's all not in vain? Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things is, is I'm very open about it with people. I don't, I, I don't shy behind it. And the reason is people then come to me later and say, can we talk? Mm -hmm. um, so now I, there are countless people that text me um, and call me. I'm sure just by saying this now on our episode, yeah. there'll be a few people that'll, that's just what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people that are all macho and, and got money and popular and got all the stuff that they think is being a man. Um, and they'll call. Do you think there's a, co like it's a coincidence that the people that you thought were the most confident or the least broken, so, you know, quote unquote, were actually the ones who did reach out? Mm. Do I that, think like, it's a coincidence? A coincidence that the, the men who might need the most help look like the ones who don't. The most, yeah, the most put together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's, it, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of the times people that are the most put together yes. um, are put together because for they, reason. for a reason, yeah. they have they have stuff. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so, you know, tell me what, when, when you hear um, a man um, express his journey mm -hmm. and I'm real careful cause I don't want to excuse my behavior. Mm -hmm. See a lot of people have said to me, well, are you excusing it because you've been molested and you've had this experience and you had this and therefore it excuses your behavior. And it's like, no, no, I don't want that to ever be it. Mm -hmm. It might help explain mm -hmm. some of it. Mm -hmm. Um, which is why I talk about it. Cause there are explanations with why we are who we are. Mm -hmm. But, um, how does that, how does that, how is it received? by you as a woman who stands very strong for feminism. I mean, it, it feels really good, but then at the same time, it makes me also upset or angry or sad that this is so rare. <laughs> and to your point, if there were more safe spaces amongst men uh, to share what they're really truly going through, perhaps there wouldn't be as many men who are blowing up their lives or hurting the women in their lives, mm -hmm. right? Until it, it blows up so much that they have to face it. It makes me wish, yeah, like I, I have mixed feelings about it. There, there's a part of me that's, I mean, so so grateful. And then the part, there's a part of me that's like, why doesn't this happen? Why is this so rare? Why mm -hmm. is this the exception rather than the rule? Mm -hmm. And how many lives could be changed, men's lives, mm -hmm. and then the women that they love, uh -huh. if if this w happened in every school, <laughs> right, across America or every, uh, you know, fraternity, right, like locker room, that mm -hmm. the male spaces that we have, which there are many male spaces, like pretty much, you know, to your point, Every space could space. be think as yeah, being safe <laughs> for men, you know, in in many ways. But in many respects, it's not like yeah. 
And so it, yeah, it makes me happy and sad. Mm. Liz, is there a misconception that you think men have um, th that if they share their problems mm -hmm. or their trauma or their vulnerability, that they will then be seen by women mm -hmm. as mm. a threat or a bad guy, mm -hmm. right? Because as, as we've seen on the show a few times, mm -hmm. as men, we so often want to be the good guy that we mm -hmm. become the bad guy, right? Sean Mendez, we talked yeah. about this. But we so often want to be the good guy, it's almost like we have to make a false choice, which is we can't acknowledge that we are good guys having done bad things. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, like in order for us to be seen as a good guy, we have to have always been good. Like there's no space to have yeah. had growth or learning or been hurt or right. abused and have then abused. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, is, is there a, is there a false choice? Is there, mm -hmm. is there a fear of being? Yeah. It's so funny you say that because when I look back at my relationships with men, the guys who are the most, um, assertive in their outward feminist perspective or per uh, sorry i'm gonna say that again performance because i'm gonna say performance because it felt like a performance like the guys who were the most outwardly i am a good guy mm. and i respect women and i'm not threatened by women's power like have been the, the worst. yeah like i talk about this you know privately but <clears throat> I mean, I was in an emotionally and it started being physically abusive and I got out relationship with a guy who literally wore this is what a feminist uh, looks like t-shirt yeah. while he would <laughs> like abuse me. And I think there was just such a disconnect for me hmm. because again, speaking about safety, like as a woman, you're constantly looking for safety. You're constantly analyzing spaces and people uh, to, to, to know, is this a safe person? Is this a safe space? And I felt, I felt so betrayed, mm. actually, more by good guys than bad guys, <laughs> because it is like a form of gaslighting, right? It's, it's a, I'm a great guy, but then they're, you know, mm. what they're, what you learn in 12 step programs is turn down the volume, look at what they're doing. Yeah. When the actions don't line up with words, I think that's the, one of the biggest forms of betrayal that, that, that women, you know, mm. have to deal with in, in mm. a sexist society. I'm sorry. Thank mm. you. <laughs> so it made me sad for you. It so does. Oof. God, this world. which is <laughs> a lot part why I'm. Uh, we are also going to do an episode where we, yeah, we're going to learn about Liz, Liz and I'm, um, I'm interested to, <laughs> us to do that. Yes, <laughs> so but, let's. But got to stories. end, you know, on a positive, I think yeah. it's so wonderful, mm. you know, to hear men talk about their mistakes. Yeah, and I think that to Jamie's point, you know, you didn't just get into, uh, you know, hit your rock bottom and then go out and tell everyone about it you you and 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 sort of put that emotional responsibility onto the women in in your lives to to forgive you mm -hmm. right that's a big thing of like mm -hmm. de you didn't demand forgiveness i'm Not. sure right you make amends so you say what you would have done differently but you don't demand the other person you know feel a certain way about it mm -hmm. uh, but it, it it would be so wonderful if there was a 12 step program for masculinity in america right where mm -hmm. men literally went yeah. and made amends like i would love to hear from that ex boyfriend well, I, think, I think all 12 step programs yes. on some sense i i actually yeah. think all people I agree. need to be yes. in one of some I because agree. part of that is about it is um, that is a good thing for men to do and learn about their masculinity. Yeah. Um, let, uh, sorry, Jay, you want to say something? No, before I was going to say Emily and I have talked about this a lot, and we've noticed that the people that we're the most drawn to have all been through or are in recovery. Oh yeah, yeah. Once there start, are yeah. very few people that we are really, really, really close to yeah. mm -hmm. who haven't, mm -hmm. and. It feels like a, it should be a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. Like it feels like we should be teaching this in elementary school. Oh, 100%. Um, mm. and, uh, and I went to a meeting um, and started going to meetings myself. And I have never felt, like I remember the first time I went to a meeting, I was like crying. Oh yeah, just, the whole Just time. listen. Yes, yeah. And it was like, and my thought was, why doesn't this exist in the world? Like, why don't we, why don't we treat everybody this way? Why can't the world be a safe space? And, uh, 
And I think in some ways, in many ways, that's, I think that's why each of us are here. And, um, and, and I hope for our listeners, you can take some of this and apply it to your life. You know, go to, I would, I would encourage, you know, there's a whole lot of different 12 step programs. Yeah. Don't be too man enough to not go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, even if you don't feel broken, it's like therapy. No. It's yeah. like these misconceptions Yeah. or all broken. I'm reading a book right now about um, parenting and how to deal with um, tears and tantrums. Mm. And I'm learning so much about myself and my own trauma mm. reading this book and, and the littlest things, the littlest things can be traumatic for us. And who are we to judge if those things are considered big enough or not? Like right. the littlest tiny things can be traumatic and can stay with a child until they're an adult and cause that adult to do which is why terrible things with our children we got to constantly be talking to them yeah. um so that those traumas whatever they are those little ones yeah. can be dealt with mm -hmm. because it's much easier to deal when they're like when they're first there yeah they don't have to be long lasting yes as much as and, when they just go on yes and creating to. all these coping mechanisms to survive indeed then, yeah back to safe spaces yep so let's all let's put this into action for our listeners here. As a woman, Liz, what does a safe space feel like for you? I love that question so much. <laughs> I love it. I want like every man listening to hear you say that and ask a woman that question, like any woman that question. Uh, I've never been asked that question. Mm. Makes me really sad. A safe space is a space where obviously I feel unencumbered, right? That I get to just exist and be in, mm -hmm. in, in the world. And it's funny because as a 34 year old woman, I can tell you like sexual harassment is basically, and as I'm saying this, I'm gonna knock on wood, but it's almost doesn't happen to me anymore because I think people just see me as like a lady uh, as opposed to when it was the worst was when I was still a child, which is the experience of pretty much every woman, like when she was 16, 17, or even younger for me, because I was tall too, was the worst, you know, where no space was safe. Like even mm -hmm. taking the bus, uh, you know, I, I took the public transportation really young because my parents worked and everything was nuts. Uh, and I remember just being like, thinking literally that there was something wrong with me. I mean, mm. I've talked about it on the podcast where, mm. and I was like, oh no, it's just men are staring at me because they want me. And I was like, 13, you know, mm. um, so that wasn't safe. Right. Um, and now I feel like there are more spaces that, that, that feel safe for me as, as a woman, because I don't, yeah, I don't feel different. <laughs> I feel like that's the, that's the definition of a, of a safe space mm. where you don't feel different from anyone else. And I think a lot about that with, you know, gender, obviously with race, right. My friend, Jelena Maxwell talks about this joy of going, you know, going to school and being carded all the time, mm. like in her own school, because they would just assume that she wasn't from that school because she was black. Right. And so that to me is not a safe space because people are, are seeing your difference rather mm. than seeing your humanity. So if there's a man that's listening, what can he do mm -hmm. to make the spaces he's in with other women specifically feel safe. And then Jamie, I'm gonna ask you that question about men. But. Yeah, I think literally asking <laughs> is, is a really good mm. one. And if you are in a situation, in wh whether it's in a public place or at a party or whatever it is, where it, there is like that question in your head that goes off, that's like, is this a dangerous thing or is she okay? Go ask her. <laughs> Trust, like always ask and, because intuition. she probably isn't right yeah. like if that has gone gone into your mind as a man it probably is that it's mm. it's not and so check in on her and most importantly uh check in on the men mm. around because mm. there's probably very little she can do to uh increase her safety and there's a lot that you can do to increase her safety as a man mm. so it comes back to what our friend emmanuel Acho talks about which is invest your privilege it's like what I would love men to see is all of the social capital that is like, like in their pockets. Like they they're so rich mm -hmm. in you know. I think often we talk about it in a negative way, like oh you have all this privilege and like check it. No, don't check it. Keep it. Invest it and invest it. Mm -hmm. I would love that you know to be invested in in every space, and then the world would look a lot differently. Mm. Yeah, mm, I love that. Thank I you, love Liz. that. Thank uh, you. So you hear that, men? Ask the women in your lives mm. what you can do to make 
a space that you share with them feel safe. Mm. And now to the men, Jamie Heath, you are a safe space for a lot of men. Mm. I'm one of them. The amount of times you've been a safe space for me and a safe place for me, I cannot even count. And uh, it's, especially even as it got confusing for me with this, like with some fame and feeling like, and then, cause what ends up happening is you withdraw, which people don't really realize is you end up withdrawing. You might be like getting uh. bigger publicly, mm -hmm. but then you actually withdraw and you become lonelier than you've ever been. Wow. And when you're lonely, that's when, yep. that's when the rest of the shit comes in and trauma and things fester. And you've been, you've always been a safe place for me. And safe doesn't mean easy right. or mm. fun. And I want to be clear about that. Yeah. Safe isn't just like, oh, kumbaya. Safe is like, no, no, no. You can't say that. That's not okay. Let's talk about that. You're not that guy. Don't do that. And you've done that for me a lot. What does a safe space for men look like? Hmm. I think a real true safe place for men, like honestly, um, where you're safe is when you can put your armor down, you don't have to posture. Um, you know, which takes a minute because we all put it all on throughout our lives and, and whiten our teeth like, like I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when you can find a friend and people who uh, you can take it off and um, will tell you the truth mm -hmm. with love, but will tell you the truth because I think we want to know truth, but um, we don't allow ourselves to get it and hear it. So when you put yourself in a place where you're vulnerable, um, the safest place, even though it's not easy, but ultimately the safest place is with those that tell you the truth that are vulnerable and you can put your armor down. Mm. Um, that's all I got. I know we need to wrap up. Let, can I can I end with something? Because there's a few things I'm not. My... Yeah, but let me just say one thing before you do that. I'm just gonna jump in and then you can then we can wrap up. Um, I agree with you completely. So for men who have never had a safe place, who have never been able to express their stuff, who don't have a Jamie, um, where do they go? So a few of the things that I've learned in my research and doing this work is that there are actually some amazing men's groups. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I've, I've interviewed a few and been on a few podcasts and they're doing really important work. Yeah. And they're taking pieces of what works in 12 step programs mm -hmm. and creating safe places for men. Um, and I would encourage you to Google men's groups in your area. And you know, there's a, it's a, it's a pick your poison, if you will. There's all kinds of different men's groups and places that you can go and where you can be authentically you, you're vulnerable, broken self and um go to a 12 step program and yeah. and google also 12 steps. google a 12 step yeah. program they're that's a safe virtual. place boy they're all easy to join you don't have to put in your camera and you, you think can... in your mind that they are uh you know they're gonna come and be uh i don't know whatever's in your head mm -hmm. of what you think who's there then you go and you go like oh okay he looks like me he looks yeah. like me he's just yeah. that person he's a ceo he's a this mm -hmm. he's a that mm -hmm. and they're all powerful people yeah and vulnerable mm -hmm. um but you know what I also say? I don't, yes, do that. But a lot of men won't do that because whatever. Sure. But I would say it's in your midst. I would say you already have a group of friends. A lot of times you guys get together and you watch sports and you go out and you go bowl and you smoke and you drink, whatever it is that you do. I would say if there's anything that's in you that thinks, ah, I kind of want to uncover that. I wouldn't mind talking about that. I don't know. Uh, put an email out to your friends already in your group and just say, hey guys, on Friday night, I'm going to get together. And let's talk about um, something that's deep in our hearts. I don't know, it might be corny, might sound stupid to you, but let's get together and just have a talk about what's going on in your lives. Mm -hmm. I bet already friends in your midst will be like, oh, okay, I'll be there. Mm -hmm. Just a step doing that. But, but yeah. no one, oftentimes we don't have permission or think it's, you know, it's gonna be rejected. Yeah. I bet it won't be rejected. No, there's a good chance it won't. Mm -hmm. we, gotta, we have to stop underestimating the capacity of the men in our lives. Agreed. Yes. And, uh, and when we do that, then I actually think, interestingly enough, by creating safe spaces for men, I mm. think we'll 
inevitably make the world safer for women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I do agree for everyone. So um, yesterday we had a conversation and what I've learned, I've been trying to get myself to get to this point, but um, my mother, who is a woman, um, I have emotionally not showed up for. I have reason. I have trauma with it. Young boy dealing with bipolar um, throughout life uh, is not easy. Um, and I've witnessed her go through a lot, which has affected me a lot. Um, I was, I was the first person to find her when she made a bad choice. And, uh, that stuck with me and I'm, um, and a lot that I've had to, I've been her savior and I don't want to be her savior. One, right. But she's worked so hard and I have this thing that stops me. And, and I feel like if I can show up for my mom, who is a woman who, um, not that I don't do it because she's a woman, I do it because she's a person. Um, but the act and the practice of doing it also will help my relationship with others. So, um, I hope I can do better at that for those of us who are challenged with showing up for, for those. Um, I think that's a manly thing to do, Mm. a person thing to do. Um, also I want to say this, uh, I was not able to show my son who's 18. I was not able to um, honor his mom. And um, demonstrate what it means to be a husband and a man to his very mother. And I hope that I've been able to demonstrate that um, with my wife. But I want to say to um, his other father his stepfather, but who's his other father, um, how much I appreciate him for showing up and stepping up and showing his mom um, love and respect and honoring her. That another man's doing that for my son. And I want to apologize to my daughter, my oldest, Jasmine, for um, um, you know, <laughs> she loves me so much. I'm her. I'm her hero. Um, and that I hope that I've, you know, that I have not demonstrated um, what a man might be because my choices affect her. Um, and more importantly, most importantly, the mothers of the ones who I've hurt and the fathers and the siblings and the cousins and all of the homes next to the homes that I burned. Um, I'm so very sorry. And I will not let my damage be in vain. I will continue to be accountable. I don't want this to be ultimately about me. I want it to be about um, victims that are hurt, Um, you know, so, uh, all right. Maybe this is just there. Maybe we don't air this episode. Maybe this is just uh, good for us, bro. We're we're airing this episode. (laughs) So if you like what you're hearing, uh, it means so much to us that you hung out and, um, and that you were a safe space for us. So please like and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to manenough.com slash podcast. And do not forget, if you are a man listening to this, like Liz said, ask a woman in your life what you can do to be a safe place for her. This is the Man Enough Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>